Hey guys, we're going to continue with Peek. As of now, he has met Zopa. He met Sanjo first. He became his new friend. Um, he Sanjo is about the same age as Peek. Um, Zopa, they meet Zopa. Zopa's a pretty serious guy. He will give you as much information as you need. Doesn't give him more. Uh, Peek has learned that not to ask questions. Kind of just go with it. And Sanjo keeps reminding him that too. Like, you'll get used to it. Um, but as of now, like his dad is not taking care of him. It's right now, it's going to be Zopa and Sanjo, um, who are more apparent in peaks every day or more, they're appearing more in peaks every day. All right. So let's just go through a couple of terms that I think are good to help us imagine the story again. Here we go. Valleys. I put valleys in Tibet just so that we can picture kind of like what peak is looking at. Or what he's talking about. Rustic villages, those villages that are a little bit more on the out, outer areas where the rural areas where you know there's not a lot of city life or not a lot of um, like here in the suburbs there's not a lot of rustic anything because there's people are still populated here. And then we hear the word till which means to prepare and cultivate the land for crops. He's going to say that they're tilled by oxen so we modern farmers use tractors but the farmers that have not modernized um still use animals so still use oxen they use cattle um especially like in in countries where they're not as um industrialized or they're not as modern um in certain areas so keep that in mind uh, oh, and basically plowing means like they're like digging into the dirt and turning the dirt over, making it soft so that they can go ahead and uh, get it ready for the crops. We're going to hear the word backdrop and it's not backdrop like in like the TikTok shows or the YouTube videos, um, sorry, the TikTok videos or the YouTube videos where you know, like the backdrop of the speaker, but it can relate to it in the sense of like it's the backdrop of the um the surrounding, the background. So for Peak, uh, his background to everything will be end up being the, the mountains, right? So because he's in the mountains area, he'll be in Everest. So that will be his background scenery. Um, alrighty. And then we have Mount McKinley. I just wanted to remind you of, about it. Um, he's going to mention it one more time so you can help uh, think about it. Then we're gonna think about uh, Mount Rainier, which again, Peak is going to mention it. That's found in Washington State. And we're gonna hear the word dwarfed, but we know dwarf, and we some of you think about Snow White, uh, but dwarf just means um, cost to seem small or insignificant in comparison. Um, so some of the mountains around are dwarfed in comparison to Mount Everest, right? So they're smaller than made. Obviously mountains that are really big, they're, they're ginormous, right? They're huge. But in comparison to Mount Everest, they're dwarfed. Mount Everest is way bigger. So even though the mountains like Mount McKinley are tall um, and go all the way at high altitudes, they can be dwarfed by a much bigger mountain like Mount Everest. All right, and then he's gonna mention a spotting scope. Um, basically, people use it to be able to look at um, things from afar, usually used for hunting. We're gonna hear the word kilo. We just, we're doing it currently our lesson in conversions of measurements. Kilos, well, that's the metric system. We don't really use that in the United States. We use pounds. He's gonna say something about like the gear or something is 50 kilos. Well, that means 110 pounds. So, so that you know how much 110 pounds um, that he's going to refer to 110 pounds, but he's going to call it 50 kilos, which is in the metric system. And if you've been paying attention to our math, you would recognize that. Um, and then they're going to mention the friendship bridge. Um, it's the bridge that is spanning in the Suncosi River. Um, it connects Nepal and China. So here's the friendship bridge. 
So when they mention it, this is what you should be imagining. Let me put a close up. Okay. And then surly, which just means bad tempered, unfriendly. Then you're gonna hear peppered with questions. Basically that means someone is asking rapid fire questions, wanting you to respond to everything that they're telling you or asking you. So just to ask someone a ton of questions one after the other, Usually like reporters do that when they're interviewing or a detective probably is doing that when they're trying to inter make do their interview with their suspect. Um, so peppered with questions means, or even children do that to their parents, right? Like why, like when are we gonna get there? Like how much, for, how much longer? And when you become impatient, you start peppering your parents with questions. Um, and then the monastery, which is a building or buildings occupied by monks to live out their religious vows. And then I'll just show you a couple pictures. They're usually like away from busy civilizations or busy areas. All right, let's go ahead and start peak. Tibet. The next morning, Sandra Zopa, the driver, and two Sherpas were sitting on the tailgate drinking tea. By the look of their disheveled hair and rumpled clothes, they must have slept in the truck. Sandra confirmed that they had. But only for two hours, he said. We were out getting supplies up until then. He wasn't kidding. There was so much stuff piled in the bed. I didn't know where we were going to sit. The bed means like the back of the truck. We squeezed ourselves between the gear along with two Sherpas, brothers named Yogi and Yash, and left the blue haze of Kathmandu behind us. We took our time stopping at Buddhist temples and monasteries along the way, where Zopa picked up boxes of food and supplies. We already had plenty of food and some of the food he was given wasn't going to last very long up the mountain. I asked about it, but got the standard shrug in reply. Away from the city, Nepal was everything I had imagined it to be. Beautiful valleys, rustic villages, fields tilled by oxen, Pulled plows, all against the backdrop of the massive sparkling Himalayas. I had been up on Mount McKinley and Mount Rainier, but they would be dwarfed by these snow covered peaks. We stopped for the night outside a tiny village. Sanjo and I started to help set up camp, but Zopa waved us off. You two, go climb, he pointed to a wall about a quarter mile away. Don't fall, come down before dark. He didn't have to tell us twice. We jogged over to the wall. It wasn't a difficult climb, but about halfway up, I had to stop to rest and catch my breath. Sanjo, who had picked a more difficult route, scrambled up the rock like a lizard, smiling as he climbed past, which taught me a couple of things about him. He had much better lung capacity than me, and he was competitive. Climbers will tell you that the one that the thing they love about climbing is that it's just them against the rock, blah, blah, blah. That may be true if they were alone on the rock, but put another climber next to them and the race is on. I was shocked when he blew by me so effortlessly. I was the kid who was going to climb Everest and Sandra was just along for the ride up to base camp. Then I reminded myself that 10 days ago, I was clinging to a skyscraper a few hundred feet above sea level. Not exactly the best training for scaling the highest peak in the world. If I was going to summit, I was going to have to do better than watch Sanjo's butt disappear over the top as I hung below him gasping for breath. I think you better I think you picked the more difficult way, he said, when I finally sat down next to him on the rim. We both knew this wasn't true. I appreciated his saying it. He, we sat on the edge for a while, taking in the view. It was too late to climb down before dark. So we decided to rappel to the bottom. Sanjo offered to let me go first, but I shook my head. First up, first down. 
When we got back to camp, dinner was ready. Zopa didn't say anything about the climb, but there was a spotting scope set up on a tripod pointed at the wall. He must have watched the whole thing. The next morning, Zopa told us the truck was overloaded and that Sanjo and I would have to walk with our heavy packs. Why did Zopa do that? Sanjo complained as we watched the truck drive up the road. The truck is fine. We haven't picked up more than 50 kilos of supplies. I shrugged, but I thought I knew the answer. Zopa thought that I, a hike with a full pack would do me good and didn't want me to walk alone. Sorry, Sanjo. The walk was hard, but it was better than bouncing around in the back of a truck, and it gave Sanjo and me a chance to get to know each other better. Sanjo's father didn't want him to become a Sherpa. The reason I climb, he told him, is so you won't have to. Does your mother know you're on the way on your way to base camp? No, and she would be very upset if she knew. Later that day, I spilled my guts about climbing the skyscraper, which I immediately regretted. When Sancho figured out that I was telling the truth, he stopped in the middle of the road and laughed for at least five minutes. It didn't seem that outrageous to me, but I guess to someone who lives in the shadow of the highest mountain in the world, climbing a skyscraper is pretty lame. Does your mother know you're on your way up to Sagarmatha? He asked. I don't think so. And she would murder me and my father if she knew. We finally caught up to the truck that evening. Zopa suggested we take another climb before we ate. But Sanjo and I revolted and told him to forget it. <laughs> the next day, he made us walk. He gave us a break on the fourth day because he wanted us all to cross into Tibet together. We reached the Friendship Bridge about noon. I suppose if you're crossing south from Tibet into Nepal, the name fits because Tibet is friendly to Nepal. But if you're going north from Nepal into Tibet, there's nothing friendly about it. The Chinese border soldiers were surly, suspicious, and rude. They examined our papers for nearly an hour and peppered us with questions I didn't understand. Zopa handled the answers calmly, but the rest of us were nervous, especially Sanjo, who had started to sweat even though it was only 35 degrees. What's the matter with you? I whispered. Nothing, he whispered back. Chinese. The soldiers nearly dismantled the truck looking for contraband. They didn't find any but they did manage to steal some of our stuff in the process. Food, mostly, but no one called them on it. The day before, as we walked, as we had walked, Sanjo had given me a short history lesson about Tibet and China. It wasn't pretty. The People's Republic of China invaded Tibet 50 years ago. Since that time, over 6,000 Buddhist monasteries and shrines have been destroyed and hundreds of thousands of Tibetans have been killed or jailed. Which brings me to that boulder in the middle of the road. The prisoners were cracking into gravel. We passed by it an hour after we got over the Friendship Bridge, which sort of sums up what's happening to the Tibetans. Or as Zopa put it later that night, our brothers in Tibet have been made slaves in their own country. We stopped at every monastery that hadn't been burned to the ground or dismantled by the Chinese. Some of them were way, sorry, some of them well out of our way. The monks were grateful for the food, supplies, and gossip Zopa and the Sherpas brought. It was clear that this was one of the half dozen reasons Sopa had for taking me to base camp. Sanjo and I hiked every day and climbed every evening. By the time we arrived at base camp 10 days later, I was feeling strong. Mm, so was Sanjo. All right, so here we get to know a little bit more about um, what's happening in the environment that uh, he's in, like obviously the the Friendship Bridge and the little history lesson they gave. Um, at the same time, we're noticing that Peak is noticing things about his new friend, Sanjo. In particular, he already knew that he was a climber and he's been observing how much he loves. Um, he could tell that he's passionate about the climb. 
given as to how when Sanjo was looking at all the gear, he was like really grabbing it and looking at it and holding on to it. So he recognizes that. He also recognized in this one that Sanjo is super competitive too. And hey, when you got two people that love to do something, usually uh, a little competition can come in to play, right? So hopefully, let's hope that this is in turn uh, into something that shouldn't be because sadly sometimes competition can also uh, mess with relationships, right? Um, at the same time, I want to make sure that I want you to also note the positive qualities that Peak is recognizing about Sanjo too, just like the kindness. Like he could, even though he did notice that he was competitive, he could also um, be more like egging him on. He's not. He's being supportive. He's even like giving him compliments instead of being like, oh, look, you're slow or something like that. He's not being rude to him at all for the fact that he's not used to the altitude and he's not conditioned. And now he's walking with him too, right? He's going through the same struggle as Peak in order to make sure Peak is ready to try to climb Mount Everest. Um, also keep in mind what Sanjo said. Sanjo talked about his father. If Start paying attention to what he said um, in terms of that and, and then connect it to the relationship that Peak has with his own father. Like here we find out that Sanjo's father didn't want him to ever be a Sherpa and that his dad was a Sherpa in order for, it, it, he was doing it in order to keep uh, Sanjo from having to do the same thing, right? But unfortunately he passed away and he recognized that if he doesn't step up and, you know, does this job, um, then his sisters will have no future and he wants them to have a, a future. So please start paying attention, like what is Sanjo value? What is Peak valuing? What is Josh value? What is Zopa value? Because you're seeing that he's going around to all these monasteries that are out of the way. They're taking extra time. Um, but what is he doing? He's bringing them food. He's bringing them uh, supplies. So start paying attention to those things. Alrighty, until the next one.